Same rules as always, the first one's under the cloche. Sweet this time, yeah? I mean, that's what the title of the video says, yeah. It's down there. Hello. Yeah, it is, it's down there. Okay, yeah, it's down, it's down there. there. Here we go. Global desserts. That's what it says. Whoa! Interesting. Oh, there's no bottom. What do you mean there's no bottom? Well, I thought there'd be a pastry of some sort. Yeah, I presumed there was. Traditionally steamed in porcelain cups, we've taken them out of the porcelain cups and served them to you as they are. How do you... I don't I've given you a spoon, because traditionally they would be in, yeah, porcelain or aluminium cups and you could eat from there. They can be handheld and eaten on the streets as well. Cheers. Cheers. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Sweetened with a little vanilla. That is the exact consistency I expected it to have. Which is what? Like red bean paste. Yeah. It's like that we've had before. Yeah. And then a glutinous rice. Yes. That's yeah. kind of made from rice I'm going flour to or the world. <laughs> glutinous rice. Sometimes cornstarch as well. It's sweetened. And then basically you've got the red beans that are cooked separately to the filling, which is then steamed. They're kind of combined in that uh, porcelain cup and steamed together. So it's a combination of rice and beans. Think about where in the world that can place you. And for example, Michelin have recommended stalls in this particular country that sell this. It's one of those savoury desserts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's not like mean. super sweet. Some sugar and vanilla, but yes, you're right, not overly sweet. And if it's made well, it should be a cross between kind of smooth, silky and chewy. So it's got that chew from glutinous rice, but then also quite smooth. I like it. I didn't expect it. It's a texture game and I wasn't sure if you would like it, Dude. but absolutely loved on the streets of a particular city in this country. It's a street mm. global dessert. Yes, global street dessert. So they have desserts. streets. As always, all we need you to do is identify which country this dessert is from. You get three points if you get the country spot on, and you get one point if neither of you get it right, but whoever is closest. Can I, can I clarify how it was eaten, please? A porcelain or aluminium cup. Or sometimes, because of their texture, uh, skewers would be put in, and maybe two skewers so they don't slide around on a single skewer, but they can be dug out of the barrels that perhaps they're steamed in, and can be served on two sticks. Two sticks, and not necessarily with a spoon. Or eaten with a spoon, or wrapped in uh, like a, a bag and handheld. I've seen videos with all examples. Where in the world are we going? Jot something down, and if we need to, I'll do some maths. The centroid of the country we're looking for to the centroid of the country you've scribbled. You've both scribbled an answer. Flip it round in three, two, one. China. Japan. Oh. One of you is 1,893 miles away. One of you is a bit closer. What made you choose those? I tried to not overthink it. We only went to one specific part of Japan. We went to Tokyo. Yep. And I thought this could be something that is absolutely loved in Kyoto. And you mentioned it as a city rather than in a country. And I thought, eh, you know. Um, yeah, I, I think I started off in Japan because we've had Similar flavours there. Red bean fillings and mochi made from rice, for sure. Yeah, but then I don't know many, if any, desserts from China. OK, so this dish, the red bean cake, is also known as put chai ko. And it is from and loved on the streets of Hong Kong. So we're talking China. Ah! Barry is spot on. Absolutely nailed it. I mean, China is a huge country with lots of different provinces, yes. but China, correct? Hong Kong specifically. Oh, yes, that never happens in the first <laughs> round. Amazing. So originally from the Guangdong region, so we're talking just less than 100 kilometers from Hong Kong, but now very much associated with Hong Kong as street food, but also cooked at home and steamed in mass. So good that Michelin have recommended a few stalls to do them. Which means that, Barry, you take three points and an early lead. Wow. Would you like a second one? Yes, please. Oh, I've got it all to do. Where are we going next? Lift the cloche. Ooh. Whoa. <laughs> it looks like a cross between an almond croissant and spanakopita. Pretty accurate. So you need to find somewhere directly in between France and Greece. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. 
Now, it is a dessert that is commonly used at celebrations and gatherings because it is coiled like a snake and you can start to break off bits from the edge as you sort of uncoil it and everyone could just take a piece and away you go. So rather than a slice through the middle with all the layers, you kind of almost uncoil it as you work from the edge. I'm just breaking it off. I'm breaking it off. Oh. Oh. Oh, 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 it's so, it's so almondy and cakey. It is cakey. I didn't expect it to be cakey. Cheers. Mm. What textures and flavours are you getting and where in the world is it taking you? So it's made with either an almond flour or ground up almonds or both. But then it's like it's wrapped in filo pastry as well as a cake. Is it sweet? Is it savoury? It's incredibly sweet but yeah. doesn't feel it. Yeah. It also has some spicing in it, some cinnamon. It's got lots of uh, orange blossom water. Different variations. Sometimes they might have cardamom, they might have some rose, they might have uh, pistachio in it. Almond is the basis, and then you're right, that buttery, buttery mm. phyllo pastry. Mm. And it is called mancha, which mancha. translates to snake or coiled mm. snake. Okay. That with a strong coffee would be unbelievable. Mm. As incredible as it might be, and I have no doubt it is, I do need you to pinpoint a country. You've both scribbled something. Let's see what you got. Three, two, one. Boom! Turkey. Turkey! 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 Oh. I bet we're wrong. Right, my vast rationale, Spanakopita, that part of the world, flavourings, the almond side of things, I thought, North African-ish, so... Yes, hello. that was my other option, was North Africa, I was thinking Algeria or Morocco. Mm -hmm. However, I went down spice trade, nuts coming across from Asia into Europe, pistachios, uh, almonds and things like that, and mm. I thought that's why I thought Turkey, because it felt like a blend. I mean, when you think about cardamom, cinnamon, lemon, pistachio, sesame, sometimes mastic is used in this particular dessert, orange blossom, rose water, we're definitely thinking Persian heritage. Thought to have originated with the indigenous Berber people of North Africa. Particularly popular in the city of Fez. We're talking Morocco. Wow! Oh, no! That's so, come on, that was really good of us though. Good I logic, think... good Great. logic. I have better logic that I didn't write down though, that's the problem. <laughs> because you're right, the phyllo pastry spans across the countries you mentioned and into uh, North Africa. It really is that kind of floral, rose water, orange blossom, regularly enjoyed with Moroccan mint tea. I obviously couldn't give you that lovely. clue. Or just mint tea. <laughs> Which is also very sweet, but incredibly fresh from the mint. Uh, and yes, whilst you can get small individual ones, more traditionally, a big coil that everyone can help themselves to from the outside of the coil uh, for celebrations. Absolutely delicious. Yummy yum. What an incredible dessert. It's, yeah, that was stonking. Is that yeah. a point each? You are both equally wrong and right at the same time. So one point each yeah, I'll tell you the point. means that Barry takes the lead four to one and we have another dish. I am fascinated by this next dish. Sounds mad. Over to you. <laughs> is the S our doing for sorted or is it? Yeah, I, Kush decided to put a sorted S on it. In, in my head, that, that reminds me of uh, one of our favorite gadgets of all time. Remember the cinnamon pen? <laughs> this one. I'm gonna try it first. Oh! I don't think Ben's the most artistic amongst yes. us. And therefore, he might struggle where the gadget might shine. So traditionally it would be made in a big dish and then you would take a slice out of it as opposed to oh. sort of <laughs> spooning it. <laughs> Said to be one of the earlier versions of blancmange. It that's does, a, that's yeah. That's our safe word. No, it's our safe word, isn't it? True story. <laughs> actually is our safe it word. It is actually our safe <laughs> word. <laughs> if ever you see us in an awkward situation and one of us says blancmange, it means we need saving. Yeah. It should be sweet, rich. Milky. Milk, definitely no, milky. milky. Main ingredient is, is milk. Milk and cinnamon. Perhaps a little cinnamon or cocoa powder to dust at the end. This one's cinnamon. It's got a little vanilla in it, but otherwise it's essentially milk boiled with uh, like a cornstarch mixture so that it then That's sets. It. And it's got one other ingredient in it. I'd be interested to see if you can get that. Does it have any flavour, this ingredient? Come on to that, because the answer is yes and no simultaneously. <laughs> So this is served in a number of uh, chain restaurants and coffee houses in this country. 
It originated when a sultan requested a sweet treat in the middle of the night and the cooks at the palace only had this ingredient, which they then combined with the milk and the cornstarch to make it. The dish is kind of translates to chicken breast pudding. It has chicken breast that has been boiled, shredded, washed, soaked, pulverized, and then mixed with milk. Here's the thing, chicken of course has a flavor, but there's many steps to this to try and remove the flavor because you shouldn't, if it's made well, taste of chicken. Now I know it's there. I'm thinking chicken. Yeah, I'm thinking But I can't see chicken. Now, now the texture is reminiscent of when you have very um, overcooked chicken, you get that rubbery texture. Almost, there's a little bit of that protein in there. And we've seen various videos of this being made, but essentially, boil the chicken, shred the chicken, and then very importantly, you then wash it, leave it in cold water overnight to try and draw out as much chicken flavor. And then you take the chicken that's left, you kind of squeeze out the moisture and sometimes then either roll it out to get rid of any sinew uh, and any of the sort of fibers of chicken, or you can completely blend it into almost like a chicken, cooked chicken paste. Then it's added to the milk with the cornstarch or rice starch, sugar, vanilla, and it's finished with cinnamon on top. It has put me off a little bit. <laughs> the name doesn't call, isn't calling me anymore. Would the name call you more if it was Tavuk Guzu? Depends what that means. Chicken breast cake. Chicken breast pudding. Well, okay, we'll know. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, it's now served in coffee shops and chain restaurants as chicken breast pudding all over this country. Weirdly enough, the OG blancmange recipes of the 17th century also had poultry in them. In the same way that we would put actual meat into our mince meat pies that were sweet and fruity yeah. at the time. Yeah. Question is, where in the world is it from? Reveal your answers. Three, two, one. Forgotten. Oh, Peru. And supply charm. Oh, wow. We're far away. We're quite far away we from each other. We are far away. Baz, why Peru? Mm. It feels like condensed milk vibes. It has the, the heavy on cinnamon. The, the, the chicken thing, of course, it threw me. I don't know. Um, and Peru was just a, was a wild shot from the from the continent. You said one word mm. in all of that. Yeah. And it didn't have sultanas in it. No. Sultan. It which was there. put me into the Middle East. And then for some reason, I went to like Asia and, 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 and ended up oh, in Azerbaijan. No. Oh no, but, you're closer. But I did, I was trying to think around sort of the Middle East Sultan area. The clues are always there. Barry, you're 7,702 miles away. Jamie, just 662 miles away. Oh. Interestingly, you were both a lot closer 10 minutes ago. It's Turkey. What? Oh. He can't do that again. He had Turkey on the back of his, you can just <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> So we're talking, I mean, it is a medieval dessert from like the Ottoman Empire. However, it is now versions of it still cooked in, yeah, restaurant chains and coffee shops across Turkey. But, uh, and all across Turkey, or like on the really eastern side. I mean, that's the thing. I was obviously I did centroid to centroid, and you're you're much closer if you're talking East Turkey. Either way, you take a point for being much, much, much ten times more than ten times closer than Barry, and we move into round four with Barry leading four points to two. Last one. We've not put this one under a cloche, but give it a spin. Whoa! No. <gasps> Has that come from under the sea? I've seen this before. Is this the thing that they put? It's on. They, they, it's cake on a stick. That they spin really, really hard in oven, so it starts to like you got basically stalactites all around it. Pretty much. I so don't know from, but... a bit like a funnel cake. It's a, or it's, it's a spit roast cake. So it's on a spit roast and it is spinning over or near a fire so that you get that centrifugal spin as the batter gives you those spikes. Now, the batter is made from butter, eggs, flour, sugar, and cream, and it can take hours to make because essentially you can't add more layers to it until the previous layer has cooked. So the first layer takes a while to get a flat layer, and then you start to spin faster and faster, and that's how you create this. It's why it's a very celebratory cake. So it's different layers of batter. So cook a layer, add a layer, cook a layer, cook it, and then add, oh, okay. All on a spit, which then gets taken out, 
so, which is why it's hollow. If you look in the top, or may, maybe you lift up to the camera. I've done research on this, how it's made, where, it, where it's made. Excellent. It would be useful if you could retain that information. And my, I, so like I, a sponge, just, when you get this information, gone. you just have to work it's out- It's all gone. Where. So it's often just served plain, and it's a wonderful gift. Or, as I said, for celebrations, religious festivals, they will often have one because obviously it takes hours to make, but also it's definitely one to share. Have a taste. Oh, it's hard, right? Like. Mm. So is, it, is, it, is there an icing on the outside of it as well? Sometimes it's dusted in powdered sugar, but often it's just eaten plain because it is its own batter, cake batter. Mm, okay. It's harder and crumblier than mm. I was expecting. And it's not as sweet as I expect either. It's a bit eggy. It's a batter made from butter, eggs, flour, sugar, and cream. And the fact that it's cooked over an open fire mm. can sometimes even give it a little bit of a, a smokiness, depending on what fires. Often they're gas fires now, but traditionally they would have been wood fires. It smells funky. They have a really long shelf life, so unlike cakes that go stale pretty quick, this is supposed to be that consistency and therefore has a relatively long shelf life. It's all, for me, it's got the texture of a, of a soft cookie mm. rather than a cake. And again... It's, yeah, more biscuity, isn't it? Mm. That, along with the coffee, again, it would be delicious. Yeah. So it's called Shakotis, and that roughly means tree with branches. And it's believed to have been developed by monks in the 15th century and claims to be this continent's oldest cake. You're dead right, there's some amazing videos on YouTube that we've watched in the research of this and they're well worth having a, having a search and having a look for because it's a fascinating process. All I need from you as a country, where in the world are we? Now remember, Jay, if you get this spot on, you can take the win. That's the pressure's off. Well, except the fact you've admitted to everyone that you know all about this. <laughs> no, no, no. So you really That's should get it spot Precious on. Off. Ich habe eine Schokotis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying it in different accents to see how it fits. Yeah, see there guys, see yeah, how yeah. it goes. Hola. <laughs> Como estas? Ah, you have the Schokotis? <laughs> no, it won't be that. Good eye, mate. <laughs> <laughs> this one stumped you. We had to stop rolling the cameras you did so much thinking. Flip the boards. He's putting a second thought down as a... Just to let you know that he could have what he could have won. Revealing three, two, one. Cambodia. Fiji. Or Tibet. Boys, I don't think you've ever been further away. Oh. One of you is 9,472 wow. miles away. One of you is over 5,000 wow. miles away. We are not close, okay. My logic was, I thought that's where the video I watched was, it was from. I, I, I remember the scenery, and then when you said monks, it kind of confirmed that area. Uh, I had no logic. I was absolutely... Stump. I, my, in my back of my head, I was thinking Italy. I, I, Pol I Poland. So this cake became popular during the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, <laughs> but is now largely attributed to being Lithuanian. <laughs> Lithuanian. Uh, okay. Right. Eastern yep. European. Yeah. Yeah. That makes Funnel sense. Funnel cakes, actually. That makes sense. Prague and yeah. Yep. Yeah, Cooking cake on yeah. a spit, those kind of thinking. That's a lot However, <laughs> and, and the that. tree with branches, the shakotis, yeah. that's this kind of celebratory centrifugal baking. Wonderful. Great dessert. What a dessert. All four of them have been so interesting yet again. Comment down below, did you get close or spot on with any of them? And comment down below if there's loads more global desserts we should be checking out. But well done, boys. Barry, you take the win. Five Ooh. points to two. <laughs> Congrats.